music feels magical, doesn't it? But how can our brains instantly recognize when something sounds right or when it sounds wrong? The answer, surprisingly, has a lot to do with math. By the end of this video you'll see how these two fields, which at first might seem completely contrary to each other, are actually very deeply connected. All music is made out of sound, so what is sound? At its core, it's just the vibrations of air molecules. Think about a large speaker producing any type of sound. When you turn up the volume, you can actually see it shaking. These vibrations push air molecules. Each molecule pushes the next, until the motion finally reaches your ear. And that is what your brain interprets as sound. The cool thing is, we can represent all this back and forth motion with a very simple shape, the sine wave. The taller the wave, the stronger the push, the louder the volume. The smaller the wave, the lower the volume. Mathematicians like to represent sound using the following formula. Now, I know this may seem daunting at first, and believe me, I didn't get it the first time. But it's actually just four ingredients. Loudness, speed, timing, and starting point. The 2 pi in the equation represents a circle. A sine wave is just an unrolled circle. As a point goes around the circle, its vertical position traces a sine wave. The mathy among you may already know that a full rotation around a circle is 360 degrees, or 2 pi radians. The 2 pi acts as a translator between the circle's spinning motion and the sine wave's back and forth vibration. But how can we track this point over time? The next part of the formula, frequency and time, does exactly that. F, or the frequency, tells us how fast this circle is rotating. So as frequency increases, the cycles in the sine wave get shorter and shorter. And this is what our ears perceive as a higher pitch. The T, which means time, simply keeps track of this point over time. Think of it as a clock for the wave. It shows us the point's position at that moment. This weird symbol, which is actually called phi, tells us where to start in our wave. And while this may not change much in a single wave, we'll later see how to use it. Amplitude is how loud the sine wave is, or how tall its crests are. And finally, the sine function makes this whole thing wavy. Without it, we just have a line going to infinity. Sine is the part that vents our equation into an up and down motion, ranging from minus 1 to 1. But wait, you may ask, why is it given that we're using a function like sine and not cosine? Well, the truth is, math doesn't really see a difference. If we swap the sine with a cosine, we'd get the same sound, with the only difference being where we start. Another reason why we use the sine function is that, when you play a string in real life, the wave always resembles the sine wave shape, but not the cosine. That's why sine isn't here just by coincidence, it's a beautiful way to describe a real life phenomenon, with math. There is another real life phenomenon math can explain, imagine two violinists playing the same note, but one is just a little bit out of tune. What happens when we add both sounds together? Math has a really neat identity for this. And don't worry about the details. All this formula says is that the result produces two parts. The average pitch of both violinists and the difference between them. The closer their pitch, the more in sync they sound, almost like a chorus. It should also be noted that, we always take the difference as the bigger frequency minus the smaller one, since having negative frequencies doesn't really make sense. And due to the cosine's different starting point, it doubles our difference frequency. What we end up hearing is a blend of both waves, its pitch sets around the average frequency, while its volume goes up and down 
at the rate of their difference. As you can see in this graph, there are parts where the waves are pretty close to each other, therefore their volume gets louder. There are also parts where they interfere with each other and have a lower volume. The farther apart our waves are, the larger their dissonance, producing some pretty unstable sounds. And that raises a question. If differences sound bad, how does music combine multiple notes and still sound beautiful? The answer lies in a little concept called ratios. Starting with the concept that playing two or more strings at a different pitch could produce harmonious sounds, Pythagoras developed formulas to discern which frequencies sounded good together and which sounded dissonant. If you play a string, and then another one at double its frequency, you're basically playing the same note, only one octave higher. It's the most you can alter the note without changing its identity to another one. If you play a string, and another one that completes three cycles for every two of your root string, you get a perfect fifth. When the ratio becomes something messy like this, they make harsh and unpleasant sounds. We can easily visualize the relationship between these ratios using something called the Lisa U curves. With one wave representing the horizontal position of this point and the other one its vertical position. These curves are a picture of how these ratios interact. Simpler ratios make pretty and simple shapes. Messy ratios make tangled and chaotic ones. If we keep adding these fifth ratios, however, we find a problem. A tiny difference accumulates, and eventually, the last note does not perfectly loop to the first one. This small gap is called the Pythagorean coma, the small difference that accumulates when stacking perfect fifths. So math tells us that these so-called perfect intervals can't actually loop around perfectly, but our ears can. You see, the brain doesn't really care for that much of a perfect pitch, it only cares for a pitch that sounds just right in relation to the other notes. So if we divide our scale into 12 perfect steps, we'll get a small discrepancy from every note, but a perfect loop from the brute note to the higher up. This is called equal temperament, but it doesn't stop right there. There are actually lots of ways in which people have tried to divide these 12 steps while applying mathematical accuracy, but we won't get into those here. So we already have a pretty strong foundation to make music. We know that sound is just the vibration of air, that this vibration can be mathematically represented as a sine wave, that we can alter the sound, its pitch, volume, duplicate it, combine it with other waves, and measure its relationship with other waves to create scales for our music. But up until now, every sound we've heard is just this plain and weird sine wave. How can we change that? What if we wanted to make our notes sound like different instruments? Well, what if I told you, every sound is a sine wave. Even a guitar or a piano can be broken down into sequences of sine waves at different frequencies. This is what we call a Fourier series. With enough sine waves, you can theoretically create any sound. Synthesizers utilize this idea for a different purpose. Instead of recreating an existing sound, they create new ones. And with all the topics we've seen so far, 
from what sound even is to recreating complex sounds, we can already start to create some pretty amazing music using math knowledge. And this is no coincidence. From the basis of music to even physical things like the designs of instruments, scaling, tuning, harmony and chord progressions, all of music is just a big array of math. Math made audible. Thank you.